Good morning, First Alliance Church. How's everybody doing this morning? <laughs> well, my name is Melinda Means. Um, if you don't know me, I am the Impact Partnerships Director um, here at First Alliance. And I hope that you all had a good Thanksgiving. Everybody had a good time. You know, these last couple of months have been challenging, to say the least. But God keeps reminding me that there is still a tremendous amount to be grateful for. And, um, you know, I just personally, I am so grateful for my church family. I'm so grateful that we get the, the opportunity week after week to come here and worship together. But maybe um, this week is your first week here at First Alliance Church. And, and if that's the case, we want to extend to you a special welcome. And if you are willing, if you would just take out your phone and text NEW, the number 2, F-A-C, uh, to the number 94000, 94000, we would just like to send you a couple texts that allow um, you to get to know us a little bit better and to give you some information about how you can connect and plug in at First Alliance. Now, if you've been here for any length of time, you have passed by our ping pong ball display in the worship center lobby. And that display just really represents the uh, invitations that you all have given to others to join us here at FAC. It represents the faith conversations that you've had with your coworkers and your neighbors and your friends about who God is and what he's doing in your life and how they can know him too. You know, I think it's important for us to remember that as we enter into the Christmas season, that people are maybe more open than any other time of year to those kinds of invitations and those conversations. So if someone is here this morning because you invited them, um, we would just ask that you write their name on a blue ping pong ball and drop that in the display uh, out in the lobby. If you've had a faith conversation this week, if you would write that on a white ping pong ball and drop that in the display as well. Um, we really believe that those names are precious and important to us and also to God. So this morning, we are so glad you're here. We're having a little bit of a technology issue. So as you came in, uh, you were handed a lyric sheet. We're going to go old school this morning. <laughs> so if you would just stand um, as we begin our worship together.
to fall Cause you shake down Jesus' name Let me hold how to wake down Jesus' name Your name. 
Go ahead and be seated. Oh, it's such a beautiful song. <laughs> but you know, if I am completely honest from a human standpoint, what can often make me tremble are the unexpected storms of life. <laughs> you know, in an instant, circumstances like Hurricane Ian can completely upend our sense of security, our plans our ways of thinking about ourselves, about God, about life. And in Luke 1, Mary got hit by a storm too. In an instant, her entire world, all her plans, got completely turned upside down. She was just going about her normal daily business when the angel Gabriel came to her and told her that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. Luke 1 tells us that Mary was confused and disturbed. You know, often God's goodness is wrapped in confusing packages, isn't it? Because yes, this was exciting news. Mary was going to be the mother of Jesus. But she also was going to have to go and tell her fiance that she was pregnant with a baby that could not possibly be his. She was going to have to try to explain to him and to her family and friends this impossible set of, of circumstances that she probably didn't even fully understand herself and that she didn't really know how she was going to navigate. She faced judgment and disgrace. And suddenly, in an instant, she bore the responsibility of being the mother of the Son of God. You know, Mary's circumstances were overwhelming and impossible. But I love what the angel Gabriel did. He bookended his message to her with two statements. And they're really the only two statements that Mary or any of us really need to know as we walk through the unexpected storms of life. He started his greeting in Luke 127. He says, the Lord is with you. You see, he wanted Mary to know right from the outset that the stiller of the storm, the one who makes the darkness tremble, was with her. And then he ends that message in verse 37 with these words. He says, for with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. And so I truly believe that those two statements, the assurance that Mary got in those two statements, enabled and empowered her to be able to respond to Gabriel the way she did. She said to him, let it be as you have said. Because you see, Mary had no idea how it was all going to play out. But she knew that God was with her, that he was going to do the impossible through her, and that he was gonna walk through that storm beside her. And I think it is so fitting that this morning, as we kick off this Christmas season, our impact partner, Pregnancy Solutions, is with us here today. I have had the privilege of being able to watch this amazing organization walk moms and dads through impossible, overwhelming, unexpected situations. They are the hands and feet of Jesus that reassure these moms and dads that they are not alone. 
and that they can do things that they don't think they can do with God's help. And it's through your extravagant generosity that we help fund the mission of Pregnancy Solutions and the other impact partners that we have. Your giving helps fund the ministry we do here at First Alliance. So we're just gonna take a moment right now to continue our worship through giving. You can do that. Uh, there's envelopes in the seats, uh, underneath the seats in front of you. You can drop a check or cash in there and then drop it in one of our wooden offering uh, bins as you leave in the worship center lobby. Uh, you can also, usually we have instructions online uh, where you can give online, um, but you can do that through our website, firstalliancechurch.net, if you would prefer to give online. But let's just take a moment and say a blessing over these offerings this morning. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful that you are a God of the impossible, that nothing is too hard for you, Lord, and that nothing takes you by surprise. Lord, you are right there with us in the midst of the unexpected. And Father, we just pray for your blessing over these offerings, Lord. We pray that you would use them in mighty and unexpected ways to make an impact in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So grateful for the extravagant generosity of our church family that allows us to make impacts like this. But I'm also grateful that your extravagant generosity allows for the kinds of impact that we get to celebrate this morning as we come to this time of baptism together. This is honestly one of my absolute favorite things to do here as a church family because it's in these moments that we get to celebrate the transformative work that Christ and Christ alone can do in the hearts of those that he reaches out and touches and calls to be his own. So this morning we already had baptism in the first service and, and got to celebrate with someone who was coming to say, I want everyone to know that I've crossed from death into life, from darkness into light because of who Jesus is. I want to make that public. And now we get to celebrate with three more in this service who have made that step towards Jesus as Jesus opened his arms and welcomed them in. So we are thrilled to be able to do just that this morning. And I want you to know if you're new uh, to our church family and, and new to this kind of gathering, we get excited uh, when people are baptized. We hoot, we holler, we clap, we get a little bit rowdy. Um, and if you've never done that before, I want to encourage you, start doing it now. Rejoice with all of heaven as we come together to celebrate this. Baptism is just an outward expression of an inward transformation, a work that Christ has already done as these young ladies that we're going to be celebrating with this morning come to say, I want to make my faith in Jesus public. So cheer them on as we announce their names and as we tell their stories and, and as Dwayne baptizes them this morning, uh, you go ahead and cheer and, and just celebrate along with them. Um, so right now, we're going to walk through each of these. First up, I'm excited to welcome up here to the platform, Miss Melissa Hensley. Melissa, you come on up, sweet girl. <laughs> so Melissa is actually in the fifth grade now, but she can recall a time back when she was in a church when they lived in Ohio. They were there in Ohio. And an older lady actually shared the gospel with her. So when she was about six years old, it's cold, baby girl. I'm telling you, the heater was busted. And you just, you're going to get all kinds of Holy Ghost when you come out of that water today. And when she was about five or six, uh, she, she actually said that's when she decided to ask Christ into her life. Then in the summer of 2021, she went to a camp. And something that the speaker said uh, touched her heart. And she went up to the stage and tied a ribbon at the cross there. And in that service, it was a symbol of her desire to follow Jesus more closely. So Melissa this morning wants to get baptized now. I love this. Listen, first of all, to obey what God has commanded. 
I think sometimes we forget that we take these sorts of faith steps because that's what God's called us to do. That's what he's required of us to do. So she said, first, to follow through on what God has commanded, but to show everyone the personal faith that she has in Jesus. She shared with Tracy as they met together that she looks forward to continuing to grow in her faith and in her relationship with Jesus as she learns here at church, at home with her awesome parents, as she's connected with Good News Club, and as she spends more time just reading the Bible and praying for herself. So here she is, Miss Melissa Hensley. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, I love it. And this is great. This is one of those mornings we get to see how God is working in a family. So I want to welcome right now Miss Evelyn Hensley to come on up to the platform. Come on, little miss. This is fantastic right here. Just listen to this. So Tracy got to sit down with little Miss Evelyn, and she got to kind of rehash a discussion that Evelyn had with mom right after the hurricane. And as they were talking through that, Evelyn's response to Miss Tracy was, yes, I really want to get baptized. I love that. I absolutely love it. She said, I want to get baptized because I just love Jesus so much. So during their conversation, Tracy and Evelyn got to read through a couple of verses together. And Evelyn was able to show, this is what I love, even at her age, that she understood her own sinfulness, her own brokenness, and that she could try. This is what was cool. Evelyn understood that she could try not to sin, but that only Jesus could make that possible in her life. Only Jesus could do that. She explained that Jesus didn't have any sin, and that's why he was able to pay for ours. How powerful is that? So Tracy shared with her that some people, you know, read the Bible and think it's full of good stories, but, but maybe it's not all true. And Evelyn responded almost immediately as Tracy was saying that and said, oh, no, 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 I know it's true because it's God's words. So she prayed, Jesus, I know that some people don't read the Bible and don't believe it's true, but I do. And she asked Jesus to be in charge of her. And today, she wants to make that decision public through baptism. Here she is, Evelyn Hensley. Good job, Kim. Evelyn, this morning, I baptize you in the name of the Father, <laughs> Son, and the Holy Spirit. beautiful is that. I love it. We got one more here, so you make her feel welcome. Welcome into the platform now, Ms. Lucy Toman. Come on, Lucy. Uh, so those of you who may know the Toman family, you know this already, but they split their year between here in Port Charlotte with us and in North Dakota. I bet you guys are preferring this right now over North Dakota, aren't you? I'm telling you. Anyway, uh, as they left from Florida earlier this year, uh, earlier in 2022, uh, Lucy was already talking to her parents about being baptized. And Tracy asked Lucy, why? Why does she want to be baptized? And I love this because kids a lot of times have all kinds of responses. And sometimes we got to talk a little bit longer with them, don't we? But her response was so spot on. She said, I want to do it to show others that I believe in Jesus and to show his grace and forgiveness. So she explained that her moment of decision to follow Jesus was a couple of years back when she'd been struggling with nightmares and had prayed with her parents, her mom and dad prayed with her over that. And it was that point she gave her life to Christ. And it is so clear that Lucy's faith is authentic and real and it compels her, listen to this, it compels her to share with others. Listen, her mom, Jess, was saying that Almost always when they meet new people, Lucy will ask, do you think they believe in Jesus? 
Lucy's spoken with several of her cousins. She's asked them if they want to follow Jesus and have eternal life. And two of them said yes, and Lucy prayed with them. Good job. Way to go. So today, she's getting baptized to demonstrate and share this belief with you, her church family. Good job, Lucy. Amen. Church, let's stand together. Let's rejoice. Let's lift our voice and sing.
Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the light that you have given that shines in each and every one of us, Lord, as we call and as we believe on your Son, Jesus Christ. For you who are up in the heavens, who sits on the mighty throne, came down to make sure that we knew there was a love that is unmatched, that is so beautiful, Lord, and you shed it abroad in each and every one of us. To you and you alone be the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you guys so much for that. Well, first of all, I hope you all had a very happy Thanksgiving. Did you guys have a great Thanksgiving? Sure, yeah. How many of you ate too much turkey? I can understand that. I hope you did have a wonderful time. I know, I know some of you had a Thanksgiving similar to the Hill household, uh, where it was just nice, tight, close family because no one else wanted to be around you. <laughs> Thank you guys for your prayers. Uh, I am recovering. I sound a lot worse than I feel. I can promise you that. Um, but thank you for the prayers. Greatly appreciate that. Love Thanksgiving. I love getting to get together and just really focus on practicing gratitude. You know, I think it's something that's oftentimes lost in our culture to just slow down and practice gratitude, to thank God for his provision, for his blessings, for his goodness and his kindness. So I'm always uh, thrilled about that time of year. Y'all give me a second. I'm going to pitch this around a little bit because that's a little little wild. Um, but uh, I also love Thanksgiving, if I'm just honest about it, because Thanksgiving gives way to Christmas, right? I, I love, how many of you are just Christmas fiends in the room? You absolutely love Christmas. How about this? How many of you already have your decorations all up? Raise your hand really high. How many of you have none of your decorations up at all? Get with the program. I'm just kidding. I'm teasing you. Um, you Grinch. Um, but anyway, no. How many of you who raise your hand for you have your decorations up? Had them up like three weeks ago. Uh, yeah, there's some of you, you're like, I'm not raising my hand, but I did. No, I, I love it. I love this time of year. My family, uh, we just enjoy it together. Um, I love the lights. We didn't do as many lights this year. Those of you who know, we decorate. We have the LEDs and all that stuff because we're crazy like that. Didn't do as many because, you know, roofers getting on your roof and you don't really want them scraping off LED lights along with the shingles. So didn't really do that, but love that. Love the smells of Christmas. Um, Y'all know I always throw out things, popcorners, go to Chick-fil-A, different products. I don't know if you've gotten any of these, but how many of you have ever picked up scent sickles before? You know what these are? These are, if you don't know what a scent sickle is, I'm just... Oh, get you a hit of that. It's just, it's amazing. <laughs> like in Florida, you don't get the smell of a fresh cut Christmas tree. It's just not a thing. But these here, they are absolute. Have you put yours up yet, Seth? Have you used them? Oh, just go home and sniff it just for fun. Just, <laughs> oh, it's so good. Uh, it actually, it's kind of got that medicinal property to it. Anyway, um, we're, gonna, we're just going to spread these all throughout the sanctuary for the holidays so it smells like Christmas every time you come in here. These things are great, but love that. The goodies, the wrapping of the presents, all of it. And then, of course, there's always the music, right? The music of the holidays that we love. On three, how about this? On three, uh, just shout out your go-to, gotta have it on the top of your playlist every single year Christmas song, okay? You ready? One, two, three. I have no idea what you said. It doesn't matter. Thanks for participating. Uh, but anyway, no doubt. Now, I get it. No doubt. Some of you aren't big Christmas fans necessarily. You're not big into the holiday itself. Uh, you love what it stands for. Some of you don't like the Christmas music. That's all good. That's okay. But uh, I, I just want to test your knowledge a little bit as we start with some trivia. So every year, Spotify compiles a list of the most streamed Christmas songs. So I looked this up on an article, last year's most streamed Christmas Songs. I want you just to make some guesses. If you get it right, raise your hand real high after you get the answer right for any one of these. And the prize is 
that you have the pride of knowing you got it right, okay? <laughs> so feel free to just shout it out as we get to each one. I'm going to give you a clue so that you don't guess these. The number five most streamed song last year was It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year by Andy Williams. It's a good one. The number four most streamed song was White Christmas by Bing Crosby. That's a great one. Really good. But how about this? Who wants to make a guess? The number three most streamed song of 2021 at Christmas. What was it? Shout it out. Shout it out. Shout it out. What's your... All right. Let's see. Let's see. You ready? Here we go. Number three was Jingle Bell Rock. Did anybody get it? You got it? Awesome. All right. So a couple of you got it. Jingle Bell Rock by Bobby Helms. All right. Uh, let's go for number two. Let's get some shout out. Get full participation here. On three, shout out what you think it is. One, two, three. All right. Oh, I think I heard somebody say it. I actually think I heard somebody say it. Here we go. You ready? Rocking around the Christmas tree. Brenda Lee. Who said it? But yeah, Tanya got it. Over here. Yeah. All right. Good. A couple of you got it. All right. Last one. If you're even remotely in tune, with Christmas culture of the past two decades, you should get this. If you don't get this, let me even throw out for you, it should be easier because every year right around this time, she thaws out. <laughs> the number one most streamed Christmas song of last year, what was it? Oh, there it was, all the one. How many of you got it right? Good job, good job. So, it's all about a Christmas playlist. Well, last year, we did a series entitled Christmas Playlist. We looked at some of the hymns of our faith. O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, all ye faithful. Joy to the world. Go tell it on the mountain. And we looked at the message and the deeper meaning behind some of this some of those songs. But this year, we're actually going to visit another Christmas playlist. But we're going to go a little bit further back. Back to the first songs of Christmas. And all four of the songs that we're going to look at are found in Luke's gospel. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to the gospel of Luke. All four of these songs that we're going to examine in the weeks ahead these Christmas, first Christmas songs are found in Luke's gospel account. They are unique in the gospel text in that they are these songs, these hymns, these psalms, they are surrounded by prose, meaning they're, they're surrounded by just exchanges, uh, dialogue, back and forth, a narrative of sorts. And then all of a sudden inserted in the midst of those, we find these songs and they are there with purpose. They are meant to interrupt our reading, calling us to pay closer attention. Many times these songs that we are going to look at are known by their opening Latin words, Benedictus, Gloria, Nunc Dementis. And then today's song from Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and following. Let's take a listen. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For behold, from now on, generations will call me blessed. And he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty 
from their throne and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. beautiful scene from The Chosen where an elder Mary recalls her song, the song that she sang upon hearing that she was going to bear the Christ child, a song that we know as the Magnificat. Now, the background, as some of you are well aware, is that at this point in the text, Luke chapter 1, verse 46, the messenger angel Gabriel has already come to Mary to announce she will carry the Messiah, the Son of God, the Christ child. During that same exchange, Gabriel informs Mary that her cousin, even in her old age, will also bear a child. So this, along with her own news, compels Mary to make a visit to her cousin, Elizabeth. Now, how many of you have ever had one of those occasions where there was a piece of information, a piece of news, something that you needed to share that you knew if you didn't get to share it, you were just going to explode? You know what I'm talking about? Anybody in the room? Now, now let me follow with this. Have you ever had one of those occasions where you had a piece of news that you were a little excited about, but you were also a little bit nervous about, and it wasn't just that you were going to explode if you didn't get to share it. At the same time, you were also thinking, how am I going to share this? Ever been there? Maybe it was a job, a job change. Maybe, maybe yours was a pregnancy announcement. Maybe it was similar to this. I can recall Uh, Many, many years ago at this almost exact same time of year, my wife and I had been praying about what God might have for us next, what we might do next in our ministry journey. And for some time, I had been feeling as though God was telling me that I was supposed to step out in faith and plant a church. Uh, I was terrified, excited, and didn't want to all at the same time. But part of this journey was I hadn't really talked to Michelle about it yet. And I knew without her having the confidence that this is what we were supposed to do, that there was no way that I was going to take that step. And I can remember praying to God and saying, God, I just don't know if this is what I'm supposed to do. I need you to make it a little easier, which is always a fun prayer to pray. But in his graciousness, in his mercy to me, he did answer that prayer. And my wife and I had gone to visit another church. We had the evening off. It was a Wednesday night. And we had gone to a church just before Thanksgiving, just to worship together, uh, just to spend some time with one another, standing alongside of each other in worship. Because in ministry, it's weird sometimes. You know, a lot of times it's like you're doing it in the same space, but not doing it together all the time because you're pulled. And so we were just there worshiping together. We hopped in the car and we headed back up the mountain. It was about a 45-minute drive. And as we were driving, we were talking about all sorts of things, all different topics. And it got quiet for just a brief moment. And out of nowhere, my sweet mama Sita looks over at me as I'm driving and says, we're going to plant a church, aren't we? I said, "Uh, uh, are we? said, yeah, I think it's something we're supposed to do. Mind you, we hadn't talked about this at all. In this moment, 
magnified, multiplied times over. I can't help but imagine that's how Mary was feeling, what she was experiencing as she headed to her cousin's house. She was thinking, I need to congratulate Elizabeth on her news. I want to let her know. At the same time, she was thinking about this this child in her own womb. I can't wait to tell Elizabeth this news. And at the same time, she was thinking, but how am I going to tell Elizabeth? How how do you tell someone you're carrying the Messiah? All these thoughts whirling through her head. She walks into her cousin's house and with a simple greeting, perhaps something as simple as, hello, cousin. She's greeted by Elizabeth. And these are Elizabeth's words, her response. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby, her baby, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Imagine her surprise. The whole way Mary's singing, I'm not sure how I'm going to share this. She walks in, she says, hello, cousin, and her cousin responds, blessed are you among women. And why is this? Granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Imagine Mary's surprise. Are y'all with me? Imagine her relief, right? Waits off of her to explain, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm carrying the Savior of the world. No, Elizabeth, filled with the Spirit, comes and says, I know what's going on here, and you are blessed. Imagine the surprise. Imagine the relief. But more than that, let's take note of Mary's response. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Two words for us to catch right there as we kick this whole thing off. The first of which being that Mary says my soul magnifies the Lord in the Greek megaluno, and it means this, to make or declare great. <clears throat> so in this moment, as Mary comes and visits with her cousin, and her cousin responds in the manner she does, Mary then responds not just to Elizabeth, but to her God by saying, my soul declares great the Lord. My soul makes a declaration of how awesome and good and wonderful he is. You see, that's the message of Christmas, that we would magnify, that we would declare the greatness of God. But Mary doesn't stop there with the introduction to this song, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices. I love this word. To rejoice means in the Greek, to become so glad that one jumps in celebration. When was the last time that a move of God in your life got you so excited that you just jumped in celebration? In this moment, Mary's response to this amazing work, even with all of its heaviness that God was doing in her life, was to say, my soul declares great the Lord and my spirit jumps in celebration in God, my Savior. You see, this should be in addition to our Christmas playlist because what we see here is the proper response to the coming of Christ, to the Christmas message, and that is Mary's song was a song of praise. Mary's song was a song of praise. It was a declaration of who God was. 
what it was that he had accomplished in the earth, what it was he was accomplishing in and through her, and what it was that he was about to accomplish. And at its core, there are two things that we see in this song of Mary, the Magnificat. And the first is that Mary's song of praise was one declaring that God is mindful of us. This should captivate us to a degree that we found, find ourselves speechless. Certainly every Christmas. But not just every Christmas, every day. That God would look upon us and see us. How quickly that has become a thought that has diminished to us in the church. Almost commonplace in nature when in fact it should instill, it should inspire, it should stir within us wonder every single time that we think of it. That God is mindful of us. And we see that in Mary's song as she speaks of his mindfulness, his attentiveness, first in personal terms. Look at what she says. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Makarios, happy, filled with something supernatural, otherworldly. He has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Many years ago, when I was pastoring, I also did a short stint as a teacher uh, at a classical Christian school. It was a short season, and it was kind of a mix of all sorts of things over those years. For about two, three years, I served as a chaplain, where uh, each week I would go in and be a part of small groups, and every other week I would actually preach and teach to middle schoolers and high schoolers, the upper school, as it was known, in two separate sessions. I, for a little while, just a very short time, I taught theology, the study of God and his work in the earth and in the lives of men, and and all throughout history. But at the same time, I also taught theater for a while. I know, kind of a crazy little mixture of all sorts of things. But during that time that I was teaching theater, one of the things that was really cool is my oldest son, Benjamin, who at the time was in the fourth, the fifth grade, he loved to just hang out after school, after classes, when we were getting ready to put on a production or a show. And in the spring, we were getting ready to do our spring musical. And so every afternoon, Benjamin would beg his mama, can I just stay with dad? And it wasn't because he wanted to be with dad. It's because he wanted to hang out with the big kids. He, it was like, whatever, dad. I just wanted to hang out with you so I could be around all the big kids, all the juniors and the seniors as they would run their lines. And he would laugh and laugh and laugh. And they would do their music and he would be you know, beat it out, because that's what Benjamin does. That's all he does constantly. If you're ever around him, he's always playing drums. And so he would sit there and beat out the rhythms as they were singing, and he would laugh at the jokes, and, and he would watch as they build sets, and sometimes he would help them with building the sets and all this stuff. And I can remember it came to opening night, and opening night of the spring musical was actually on Benjamin's birthday. He wasn't bummed by this at all. He was thrilled, because it meant he got to go and watch the opening night of the show that he had seen all the behind the scenes on his birthday. And what was so neat is after the show, the kids did an amazing job. It was absolutely phenomenal. Packed house, they did wonderful. I was so proud of them. But after the show, they were out, all gathered out in the, uh, the, the lobby space in front of this um, auditorium where they had performed. There was about 45 or 50 of them. And all of a sudden, I saw them all whispering to one another. I knew something was up. I didn't know what exactly, but... Then, like one of those crazy flash mobs that you can see on YouTube, they all circled up, and one of them grabbed Benjamin and dragged him to the middle of the circle. And in unison, they all together began singing happy birthday. So for his birthday, all the big kids, after they had worked their tails off and done this big show, all the big kids dragged him to the middle, and they took the time to sing happy birthday, Benjamin. And the look on his face was one of just utter shock, awe, and dumbfoundedness. How did they know? Why would they do this? They saw me. They thought of me. 
how much more then should we come to wrap our minds around what it was Mary was singing as she sang, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Mary's song, this song of praise, was of a God who is mindful and attentive. Her statement was one of awe and wonder. It was her saying, God, you see me? You don't just see me, but you would work in and through me. It's an echo of this, the psalmist David, who in Psalm chapter 8 wrote these words, our Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name above all the earth. And then he follows those very words, speaking of the majesty of God by saying, and what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you would care for him. Just like the psalmist, Mary lifts her voice to exalt this God. She sings a song of praise. She sings, catch this, to the one who sees a sinner and a servant and invites them to become a part of the story of God. Don't let this get lost on you. The story of Christmas, the song of Christmas, is that God saw a sinner and a servant and invited her to be a part of the story of God. You say, Nate, a sinner, that seems intense. I didn't say it. Mary said it. She starts her song singing, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my what? Savior, only someone who is keenly aware of their own sinfulness will sing a song asking to praise a Savior. She says, I want to sing to the one who sees a sinner and a humble servant and invites them to be a part of the story of God. That's us. We are nothing more than sinners, broken frustrated, lost, and yet he sees us. We are nothing more than humble servants if we so choose to be. And yet he invites us to be a part of the story that he is writing that is bigger than any one of us, and yet it still incorporates every one of us. That's the song that she was singing, that first Christmas and the extravagant nature of his grace doesn't stop there. Mary moves beyond the person to the people as she sings these words and his mercy, his mercy is for those in the Greek. It literally translates for all who fear him from generation to generation. Already Mary is declaring that Christmas will be about the coming Messiah who will make a way for his mercy to extend to all nations for all generations a gift to us that cannot be earned, but that is freely given to all, that he is mindful of us, attentive to us. She later sings of her people, Israel, and says he has helped his servant, Israel, in remembrance, what, again, of his mercy. It's the song of one who sees us, who is mindful of us, but... Let us not forget, while it is a song of one who is mindful of us, it is also a song of praise to the one who is mighty over us. It is not just a song that Mary sings of the one who is attentive and mindful. It is a song that Mary sings of a God who is of great might far beyond what we can adequately begin to imagine or comprehend. She says these words, for he who is mighty, it is his nature, it is who he is, has done great things for me, and holy is his name, his might on display in her life. 
But also look at this in verse 51 as she sings with with great conviction. He has shown strength. He has shown might with his arm. We desperately need to recapture the essence and the nature of this in the Christian faith. Yes, God is mindful of us. Yes, he desires relationship with us, but he is still God. Are you with me? He is bigger than us, far more than we can imagine. He is beyond us, far more than we can imagine. That is what Mary began to sing that night as she made that declaration. He has shown strength. He has shown might with his arm. Now, here's what's interesting. A young woman who was raised in a Jewish home, this imagery has been brought to Mary's attention multiple times. It is something she is very familiar with. The picture of God's strong arm extended. A display of his might and his ability and his alone to accomplish his purposes in earth. It's an image that was often used for her ancestors, the nation of Israel, to to remind them, to refresh their memory on just how big God was. The extension of his mighty arm was to say, yes, you are my people. Yes, I have called you into relationship. Yes, I've called you out, but I'm God. And don't you forget it. Are y'all with me? See, this is just as much Christmas as that he loves us. And oh, Jesus, sweet little baby in a manger. And oh, he came for us. Hallelujah. The might of God is just as much, if not more important for us to remember in the Christmas season than anything else. Because it is that same mighty God that made a choice to be packaged into humanity and come and live in the midst of our mess and brokenness and still display his might before us. That's what's so beautiful about these words. His arm extended. I can remember one of the gifts that we got one year. I can't recall. I meant to ask my father. I can't recall if it was for Christmas or if it was like one of those joint birthday gifts that my brother and I got. But I can remember one year we got a basketball goal for Christmas or like I said, birthday. I can't remember which one. We got that basketball goal. And listen, I grew up in an era where that made you the house on the block, okay? This was before you had like the whole portable basketball goal and you can wheel it around with the sloppy gel stuff in the bottom and all that that leaks as soon as it breaks. And this was before all of that. This was in an era, Dwayne, this was the era when you had two kinds of basketball goals. One was a laundry basket that you had somehow affixed to your parents' house without their permission and then they yelled at you. And the other was one of those hardcore posts in the ground buried in three feet of concrete. Brian, you're with me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It, it was one of those that was buried in and then a thick and big old fiberglass backboard. You know what I'm talking about? Not the glass, cheapo cut. Like it was, you could, it was a tank is what it was. So we got one of those as a gift. My grandfather, my dad got it all set up. And my brother and I, we started playing basketball and we loved it. We would play basketball, we play horse, we play one-on-one, we play with kids in the neighborhood. And I can remember uh, one of the things I had to figure out when playing basketball with Josh, as I've told y'all before, those who remember, he's a big boy. Um, I'm not a little guy, but Josh is like 6'3", and just, he's massive. It's a whole lot of man. Um, but I can remember we were playing basketball, and I, looking back, he was probably just going on easy on me on this one day. I don't know what the, no, well, no. I know he was going easy because you're about to hear the story. So we were playing basketball, and what I figured out is I couldn't drive the lane on my brother, okay? There was no doing a layup or going in with my brother because he was so much bigger, and we were at that phase in life where he was like six foot one, and I was five foot nothing. So driving the ball in to go for a layup it, Tim, it meant certain death every single time. Like I was coming up with scrapes and bruises if I did that. So I figured out, shoot from the outside. Shoot from the outside. He can't get to you quick enough, you shoot from the outside. We were playing the game one day, and I was kicking his rear end. I mean, it was embarrassing. How many? It was just lights out shooting. I was hitting everything. It was perfect. 
And then I decided it would be a cool idea to start talking trash to him. <laughs> you know where the story's going. Long story short, I started talking trash to him. And I was like, where, where you at, man? You ain't got any game. Where you at? And he was like, okay. So he goes back out, check up the ball, because you got to check up when you're playing street ball like that. He checks up the ball. And with his six foot one at this time in his life, probably 200 pound frame, he comes driving in, because that's what he did, because he was bigger than me. And so I got, I got all set. I was ready for him. All I know is, I regretted every life decision I made <laughs> up to that point. Because he came and drove straight in my chest. It was like a freight train. I hit the ground. I'm laying down there. I'm praying, just take me home, Jesus. <laughs> and he stands over top to me and he goes, you want some more, big boy? <laughs> Go back out. He checks the ball to me. And I'm like, it's no problem. I've got this. I continue to talk trash. And I go, and I'm like, as long as I stay outside, I'm good. I go to shoot the ball from outside, and it looked like a rhinoceros charging at me. <laughs> and then all I saw was this mass jump up in the air, and all I saw was his left arm extended as he soared through the air, and I took my shot, and he swatted that ball so hard that he hit it right back. That black and red Michael Jordan basketball hit it right back in my face. And I said, you win. <laughs> and see, it was in that moment that Josh needed me to remember something. As he jumped and with the extent of that left arm and he swatted that ball back down, he was reminding me, hey, remember who you are. The God of the ages through the song of this young pregnant woman is reminding us who he is. He has shown strength with his extended arm. And it would greatly benefit us to look around and be reminded of just how mighty God is and just how small we are. It would benefit us to see that these go hand in hand. Yes, he's the God of relationship, but he is also a God whose thoughts are not our thoughts, whose ways are not our ways. And the moment that we can begin to fully comprehend him is the moment he's not a God worth worshiping anyway. So it is not his might that should discourage us. It is his might that should encourage us to say, if I don't fully understand you, that's a good thing. If you do things that confound me, that baffle me, and look at how Mary highlights this in verses 51, 52, 53, 54. She lays all of this out, the might of God on display as she says a couple of things. She says, he has scattered the proud in their thoughts. Those who think they know, he's scattered him. He's brought low the mighty, those who rule and are puffed up. He's brought them down and he sent the rich away empty, not to simply send people away without, but those who think they are so self-sufficient, they have no need for a God. He says, fine, walk away, but you'll never experience the fullness that I can offer. This is what she sings. But what I love is that Mary talks of the might of God, not just in how he brings low, but also in how he lifts up. Because she says also that he has exalted the humble, that he has filled the hungry, and that he is faithful in his mercy. You see the comparison and the contrast. She says, God in his might has brought down those who think that they don't need him. And God in his goodness and mercy has lifted up those who simply say, I have nothing more than to come before the God of the universe and say, I'm yours. He scatters the self-important, the self-reliant, the self-absorbed. And he lifts up those who draw near to him. 
And what I love is what's so powerful about these words of Mary in this song is that as Mary sings, they are not just about God the Father. In this moment, as she sings this song of praise, it is also a prophetic utterance. These are words that Mary sings during this song of praise that we can see are influenced by the Old Testament prophecies of who Jesus would be. She declares his might and his strength, and it was Isaiah, the prophet, who in Isaiah 9, 6 declared, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. So as Mary sings this song, these words, she is not just singing in the past tense of what her God has accomplished. She is singing in the future tense of what this little one, now growing inside of her, will accomplish as God in the flesh. As he confuses the proud, as he exalts the humble, calling to his side fishermen, despise tax collectors, the outcasts of society. She's declaring that he will bring low the rulers and men of might, especially the religious leaders who think that they have it all figured out, and yet time and time he, again, he confounds them and says, you, you can't even begin to understand what's happening here. And he fills the hungry as he will one day himself declare in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So why? Why is this Mary song leading into that first Christmas? I'll tell you. Because only a God of that great might only a God who is that lovingly mindful can carry Mary through the journey she will have to walk next. And why should we add this song, Mary's Magnificat, to our playlist of Christmas? Because only a God of that great might and only a God who is that lovingly mindful can carry you through whatever is next. As the Christmas season brings perhaps busyness and chaos and, and one obligation and event after another, go to the one who is mindful and mighty. Perhaps as you enter the Christmas season, not filled with his great joy because it brings thoughts of loss of a loved one, Friend, only the God of that great might and the one who is that lovingly mindful can carry you through so that this Christmas season you can sing a song of praise. Father, we love you. We thank you for this precious time together. And as we leave from here, let us be encouraged strengthened by your might, carried in your loving mindfulness. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for the Christmas season and all that it really means. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you leave today, I want to encourage you. Every day this week, maybe in the morning, maybe before you go to bed at night, pause to read this song of Mary. Be challenged by it. Be encouraged by it. Be uplifted. Take some time maybe to share it on social this week. There's a lot on social media. A lot that's dumb and pointless. A lot that's discouraging and frustrating. Let's instead infuse hope into the chaos. Post those words of Mary. Perhaps it will encourage someone else this week. Pray this week, thanking him for his mindfulness, his attentiveness, 
affection for you. And take the opportunity to say, God, show me your might this week. Amen. God bless you guys. Love you so much. Have a great week and we'll see you back soon.